American Civil Liberties Union. What years? 78 to 2001. All right, team. Uh, welcome back. Uh, some, some new faces and some old. Welcome to uh, Free Minds Film, where our motto is don't just make a film, get people to see it. We're very excited to have Mr. Nico Perino with us today, the co-director of an excellent new feature documentary called Mighty Ira. And we're gonna get into that shortly. Uh, we're also very excited to continue in our new partnership with uh, Florida State University's DeVoe Moore Center. We have Amber Hedquist uh, with us, uh, Katherine Peralta is there somewhere, and Sam Staley, who is the director of the DeVoe Moore Center at Florida State. And if, if you can't remember, you can just notice the maroon colored shirt he's wearing. That's right. And <laughs> Area. Always, always with the branding, Sam. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so um, we have another event, uh, Free Minds Film event, coming up on Thursday. And we'll tease that um, a little bit later. Um, beyond that, we will we will continue. For those of you in the network already, you're probably wondering where are the Free Minds Film workshops. That's that's when we provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, consulting and rapid-fire format to uh, liberty-minded filmmakers. That is coming very soon. In early fact, December. Courtney was just talking to one of our experts before this call. So look for that early December, but again, we'll, we'll bring that up towards the end of this event. Um, so uh, Courtney, do you want to give a 30 seconds on how uh, Free Minds Film came to be, why, why we're doing this? Sure. Uh, so Ted and I, we've had our own uh, independent production company for the past almost 10 years now. And uh, we used to produce for other people, but we wanted to have more control of what we made and how it was made. And so we created Corchula Productions, which is our for-profit production company. And as we were in the independent world making films, we make documentaries, we make narrative films, the distribution world was changing rapidly, like within even the first year of our company existing. And we had to be a lot more involved in the distribution process and marketing process than we had ever really anticipated. So we were learning a lot and we thought, you know what, we want to share this knowledge with like-minded filmmakers who are making movies that have the same themes and interests that we do, especially, um, uh, you know, issue-oriented films. And, and we've made two of those that have impact campaigns. And we can certainly talk more about that, uh, especially with Nico. So we decided to create Free Minds Film, which is a network of filmmakers that we have a lot in common with, that we want to share the knowledge that we've gained over the years of making and releasing our films and that's how this came to be and so it's it's evolved to the point where uh, yeah so our main goal is to teach liberty-minded filmmakers how to reach mainstream audiences so we're not interested in just preaching to the converted um, and we do that with seminars workshops and project specific consultations um, and so with that said, let's get to the meat of this, uh, of this event. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please send them to, directly to Courtney and we will get to those during the Q&A time. Uh, so we are speaking with um, Nico Perino, co-director of Mighty Ira. And here's a little something on Mighty Ira. It profiles Ira Glasser, the longtime executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union and one of America's unsung heroes of civil rights and free expression. The film explores how baseball legend Jackie Robinson um, ignited Glasser's passion for racial justice, how a Jewish kid from Brooklyn ended up defending neo-Nazis' right to free speech, and what Americans get wrong about recent free speech controversies. Welcome, Nico Perino. Hey, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for uh, hosting me. Our pleasure. We should add we're 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 especially excited to have Nico. Uh, he's not just a friend and a longtime collaborator, but we we uh, we uh, were uh, brought on in a consulting role from this for this film, and so we're we're uh, very very uh, pleased and happy with with how Nico and his team um, created a really important and exciting project. Um, and uh, with that, uh, tell us, Nico, just first how, how you came to decide on Ira Glasser as a subject for a feature documentary. Yeah, well, I didn't have any grand dreams to make a documentary. Uh, it was 2017, and 
longtime Village Voice columnist and jazz critic Nat Hentoff. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He passed away. Uh, his, his obituary in the Associated Press said, free thinker Nat Hentoff dies. And that's all you kind of really need to know about him is he was a civil libertarian free thinker type. And I attended his funeral at Riverside Memorial Chapel on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I was there with a friend also kind of in the civil libertarian community, uh, Michael Myers, and two gentlemen come up to me, older gentlemen come up to me and they say, uh, we know you, you do what we used to do. And I turned to them and I said, well, who are you and what did you used to do? And the two men were Ira Glasser and Norman Siegel. Now, of course, Ira Glasser is the man standing behind me. He was the executive director of the ACLU from 1978 until 2001. And then the man standing next to him, is also featured in the film, was the executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU affiliate in New York State from 1985 to 2000. And uh, I was a bit embarrassed that I didn't know who Ira Glasser was even if, after he introduced himself to me, uh, because this is a man that took the ACLU from near bankruptcy in 1978 uh, to having affiliates in every state, most US territories and $40 million in the bank and oversaw a lot of the ACLU's great First Amendment defenses. And I, I work for the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education where we do First Amendment work on college campuses in particular, uh, but I also host a podcast called So to Speak, the Free Speech Podcast, where we cover free speech issues. So it was, it was doubly embarrassing to me that I didn't know who he was. So I went online and uh, looked him up. Uh, fascinating man. There isn't a ton online about him because he retired in 2001 and then kind of just retired. He didn't do much in the public spotlight after he retired, except um, help chair the Drug Policy Alliance. If anyone's interested in the war on drugs and the policy surrounding that, he's a big player in that world as well. So I invited him on my podcast. Uh, he said, I've been out of the game for 16 years. I might not remember much. He comes over to my apartment, sits down, and three hours later, uh, he's still talking. Uh, if, you meet, <laughs> I, if you meet Ira, you will know that he's never wanting for words. And interviewing actually, him was actually quite difficult. He's not, he doesn't speak in sound bites. He speaks in long stories. And uh, it's not so much an interview as it is an interruption of his monologue. <laughs> So we've had to work on that for some of the interviews of the film. But, uh, you know, the stories were, were super compelling and they told a history that young civil libertarians like myself don't really know. Uh, and, and a lot of people in my generation, I'm 30, have kind of forgotten, especially surrounding racial justice and free speech. Uh, they forget why people of Ira's generation defended free speech rights in the way they did because they forgot the lessons that came from the civil rights movement. In the, in the 50s and 60s. You know, the same ordinances as we discuss in our film that were used to silence the neo-Nazis in Chicago and Skokie, Illinois, were the very same types of ordinances that were used in the South in the 1960s to prevent civil rights marchers from demonstrating. So it's a forgotten history. And, and those uh, today who are calling for greater hate speech codes or um, other sorts of prohibitions on what they consider hateful or offensive speech, forget how these these mechanisms can be used against the speech that they like uh, as well. And as Ira likes to say, speech restrictions are like poison gas. They're, they're nice when the enemy's in your sights, but the winds has a tendency to shift. And as soon as you launch that gas, uh, you better be careful it doesn't blow back on you. So that's why we made the film. Yeah, that's a great- that's it's, a, nice. it's a history lesson in large parts. And that's why we, at the beginning of the film, Ira says, uh, after speaking with these two young girls that he meets, uh, you know, how would they ever know this history if no one told them? Uh, if no one yeah. explained it to them. And we kind of close out the film with that same, with that same message. So in the film, you, you have some elements that are, sometimes we call it sizzle or steak, or what's another one, like vegetables or bacon? Yeah, veggies, or bacon. veggies or bacon. So you've got, um, you've got things that are inherently interesting to mainstream viewers. You've got pro baseball and neo-Nazis and, um, and lots of other things you would find on on Netflix, um, but you also want to want to tell and convey some important ideas. So you want to slip in some vegetables there too. Um, how did you and your team approach that challenge, where it's got to be entertaining, but you also have to convey some important ideas too? Yeah, well, we le really let Iris' story drive the narrative, and we knew parts the parts of those stories that we're going to tell. Obviously, we didn't tell this whole story of Ira's life. We knew it going into the film based on the podcast interview I did, that we, there were some compelling stories with uh, evil villains and sympathetic heroes that we could 
tell that would make the points or tell the teach the lessons that we sought to teach, which is lessons of free speech and talking across lines of difference and racial justice. Uh, and one of the way, most compelling ways that I found that we were able to slip in those vegetables, as you like to call them, is to, uh, to do it through archival footage and not through talking heads. So one of the most compelling uh, arguments we make in the film is that, as I was saying before, speech restrictions are like poison gas. They can blow back on you. And uh, to help illustrate this, we illustrated it with one of the stories that Ira told about Hosea Williams, who was one of Martin Luther King's field generals. He was helped organize every major march that Martin Luther King had. And he appeared on the Phil Donahue show in the early 90s around surrounding a debate that America was having at that time, whether we should ban the Ku Klux Klan from appearing on cable television. And Hosea Williams is asked during that demonstration, or during that TV segment on Donahue, I should say, whether he would ban uh, the Ku Klux Klan. And you know, as a viewer, you go into that thinking that Hosea Williams, a civil rights marcher, he literally had rocks thrown at him as he was walking through, or marching through Forsyth County just months before, he would have every right to say that no, the neo-Nazis shouldn't be allowed to appear on uh, cable television. But he argued that they should have that right. And he argued it because he saw that what would have happened to civil rights demonstrators earlier in his career when the same tools that you would use to ban the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, were used against civil rights marchers. So illustrating those stories through compelling characters who you might not think would take that position uh, is a way of hooking people and keeping them engaged. And we did the same thing with Susan Bro. Susan Bro was the mother of Heather Heyer who was killed uh, during the Charlottesville rally. Susan Bro, you would think has every right to believe that speech restrictions, especially for those in Charlottesville, uh, should be used. But she was asked quite directly by an interviewer at a uh, conference in Chicago in 2019, whether she thought uh, that the people who rallied, the, the white supremacists, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them, who rallied in Charlottesville should have the right to do it again. And she surprised everyone by saying yes, uh, for the same reasons that Ira argued before. Uh, so slipping in those vegetables by surprising who uh, your viewers with who the chef is, I think <laughs> is uh, one way to keep people engaged. And, and Ted and Courtney did, as they mentioned, were consultants on this project and did a very great job in reminding me uh, of these sorts of things. Uh, it almost sort of reminded me of comedy. You try and squeeze in as many surprises uh, as you can in your five or 15 minute set to keep people engaged. Uh, same principle here. Try and get as many surprises as you can into the story uh, and you'll keep people watching. Well, that, that's that's great. And, um, and thanks for the kind words. We, we really loved working with you on it. Um, and you mentioned archival footage and you incorporated quite a bit of it in the film and it works beautifully. And I think it really did accomplish your goal of, you know, putting a human face and story to something as opposed to just a talking head in a chair. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you learned through the process of finding the footage and then obviously having to go through the process of licensing it? Yeah, it was all smooth, smooth sailing, right? It was yeah, easy. yeah, so easy. The easiest part in the process. <laughs> yeah, you're giving me PTSD just I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you, you, welcome, welcome to being a filmmaker. Uh, live yeah. the rest of your life with PTSD. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things you think you can do uh, when you're a first time filmmaker is just quote unquote fair use everything uh, because you hear that word flying around. Um, Explain but, what that is for the people who don't know. Yeah, so fair use is this idea that you can reuse the intellectual property of other content creators insofar as it's done in some sort of transformative way, creative way, or it helps tell uh, you know, you'd have to ask a lawyer the specific means by which you can fair use other people's content. But long as short of it is that you don't have to pay for it if you use it in these specific ways. Uh, but, you know, we were, I'm not a lawyer, I'm the vice president of communications for FIRE. Um, I had heard this word thrown around. Long story short, we used a lot of archival, we told a lot of history in our documentary, things that happened in the past. And turns out uh, after we submitted it to our attorney to review for fair use, we had something like 530 lines of archival footage in our film, um, most of which they determined based on their analysis needed to be licensed from the content creators. Uh, I think in the 
final analysis, we only fair use something between 50 and 70 lines of the 530 lines of archival, which meant that we needed to go find the owners of every piece of footage in our film. Now, a lot of the footage came from the net big network, CB, uh, CBS, NBC, um, uh, and ABC. But uh, a lot of it is just like one-off lines and you need to go hunt down each of those and you negotiate the terms. Uh, and the terms are based on how you wanna distribute. So do you wanna go a theatrical route? That's gonna be the most expensive. Do you wanna do video on demand? Do you wanna do educational? Do you wanna do, uh, you know, do you wanna show it on airplanes? Do you wanna show it in, in auditoriums? Um, you need to determine all these things. So you determine how you wanna distribute and then you say, this is what I'd like to purchase from you. What is your pricing? Um, and that was probably the longest process in making this film, not doing the interviews, not writing the story, um, not doing all the fun stuff that you think comes along with making a film, but hunting down the rights holders for all the archival footage, negotiating the terms and going through their process. Uh, some archival houses are very easy to work with. NBC, Universal, very easy. They have a website. You just type in the keywords for the stuff, footage you want. They'll spit it out. You, you check the drop, drop down box. Uh, for the rights you want, um, boom, you have the footage. Um, I think that it takes a couple of days for them to send it to you. But most places you uh, have to reach out to their archival researcher, ask them for the uh, for screener links or send them the keywords you want. And then they'll tell you what they have. And you say, I'd like to purchase a screener for that. And then you fill out spreadsheets with what you want. And you go from there. ABC is the most difficult to work with. Yeah. Uh, they're owned by Disney. So that's probably no surprise to many of you. Um, and also we had some footage uh, that we wanted to show that was owned by CBS, but was taken inside an MLB stadium, Shea Stadium, Met Stadium. Uh, so we needed the rights, not just from CBS, but we also needed them from MLB because CBS wouldn't release the footage to us without MLB approval. And MLB wanted to charge us $12,000 and have pre-approval for every single mention of baseball in the film. And we, we and our lawyers decided that we weren't going to do that. They, they yeah. own baseball, right? Well, as a, as a, that's what our lawyers said. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to pay for the minute of footage for CBS, which the going wow. rate right now for everything non-theatrical, including talent. So there's different charges based on whether you include talent. So the hosts or it's just B-roll. The going rate for um, talent non-theatrical is something like $163 per second. Um, and so that can rack up and then you tag a $12,000 MLB bill on top of that and just becomes uh, unfeasible. So I, I have so many stories to tell you about archival. Uh, I, I could go on all day, but I, I think I'll leave it there. I think everyone gets the gist of how much fun it is. Yeah, it, no, it's a bear and, and you tackled a big one because you used, I mean, we've used archival footage in our films, but not nearly as much as you guys used in yours. And I think it's it's an important thing to, to mention and thanks for talking about it because f filmmakers that have never done it before that go into it like yourself don't know. They, they don't realize that it, it can get really complicated and time consuming and expensive. So it's a good thing um, for people to just be aware of if they really are considered. Because like, we were like you too in the very beginning. We, we thought a lot of stuff that we use could be fair use, but mm -hmm. not yeah, I think the case. I, I'm, I'm a little more on the, you know, and, and for, we, this, is a, <laughs> this is a discussion for a separate session on, on fair use. But I think, you know, there are shades of gray and in, in what you, it, it, <laughs> it, it all depends on, you know, how, how soundly you can sleep at night or are you going to be worried about getting sued by CBS or something? Yeah, that's that's a good point, Ted. You know, different lawyers have different risk thresholds and different businesses have different risk thresholds. You know, mm -hmm. I think we had a, a fairly conservative attorney, um, but you need the attorney to sign off uh, in order to get your errors and omissions or media liability insurance, because mm -hmm. uh, no one's going to insure your film unless they know the fair use lines or the fair use clips in your film that they need to insure. That's part of the insurance process. If anyone sues you for a clip that you haven't licensed, um, you're covered under your media liability insurance so long as that spreadsheet of uh, fair use lines covers that clip. If you forgot it, then you're kind of uh, screwed. Um, right. But you know, everyone has different risk thresholds. Business owners consider that sort of thing every day. You know, what sort of risk are we willing to take on? Um, and you you determine that in consultation with your attorneys. 
And um, since you've you've gone through the ringer with archival footage and licensing, what what advice would you have for for other filmmakers who are staring at that challenge? Don't include archival footage. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but I mean that's that's kind of but the at advice. the end of the day, it, 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 it works. It works. Well, that's kind of the advice. That that's. I'm only being a semi joking there because had I known all of the challenges that went in to licensing this footage, I might not have used as much because with as with everything you did, you try and determine whether the effort that goes into telling the story in this particular way is worth it. Uh, because we were first time filmmakers, we really had no idea what went into making a film. And I think that served us in the long run, in the sense that we made the film we wanted to make. Because after a certain amount of time, you're 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 so into it, uh, you've gone so far that you can't really go back. So we had so much depended on this archival footage that we were were kind of in for it at that point. Yeah. Uh, and there were so many other aspects of the film, uh, in this case, that uh, kind of worked out the same way. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you just try and figure it out as you go along. Yeah. And there are sleepless nights, and uh, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, uh, we obviously want to talk a lot about your approach uh, to distribution, but uh, you've mentioned that the festivals were, were not the right fit for this film. It, it, is that right? Can you talk a little bit about why? Yeah, there were a number of factors that went into our determining that we didn't want to go the festival route. So the main one is that we're first time filmmakers and that a lot of these festivals, as we've been told before, kind of, it, it benefits you if you've been a festival before, if you've made a film before, or if you have connections at these festivals before, especially the bigger ones. Uh, we didn't have any of those. Um, you know, I, I know Ted and Courtney did and they, they were, were kind enough to offer to make some introductions for us. But, you know, ultimately, we, if we were going to go the festival route, we kind of wanted to do it at a big festival or a bigger festival. Uh, the other thing we were considering is that when you go the festival route, you lose some control. Uh, you don't know if you're going to get accepted to festivals. You can submit to a couple, um, but you kind of have to pick and choose because if you get accepted to a couple, you're going to have to tell the other ones no, and that could hurt you down the road if you make another film and submit. Uh, the other thing is... You know, once you release at a festival, you can't release, or once you decide you're going to premiere at a festival, you can't premiere before then. It's nice because you know you have your release date, but a lot of people also go to festivals because they want to try and use those festivals as a launching pad to secure wider distribution, VOD distribution, theatrical distribution, and going that route can take even more time. So let's say we were accepted to Doc NYC in March. Doc NYC is starting this weekend. So the film wouldn't have came out until this weekend. Um, if we were using it as a launching pad for distribution, uh, we would need to uh, find a sales agent. The sales agent would, which can take some time. And then you, the sales agent needs to pitch it to distributors. Then you need to negotiate deals with distributors. And even after you've negotiated with distributors, it's like six months to encode your film and get it up on the platforms. So we're looking at a year after the festival come release, you've told all your networks that the film's coming out. Only the people in New York City or wherever the festival is can watch it. Why do that if you can avoid it? Especially these days where there's so many different channels for distribution. Um, so that was our thinking. And this is pre-COVID. COVID, right. we would have never done a virtual theatrical or a virtual uh, festival under COVID. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. Um, you also lose a lot of the fun of being there and showing your film for the first time yeah. in person. So. There are a lot of other ways to get your film out there if you have money. Now, a lot of filmmakers will need to go the festival route because they don't have money and cost less than a hundred bucks to submit your film to a festival. Uh, and they need the distributor to, to kind of pay for things. We were fortunate enough because the film is backed by a big institution like my employer, Fire, to not sort of need that. And there are great alternative self-distribution models out there right now, including from aggregators. So uh, aggregators are institutions that you send them your film, they figure out whether the quality is sufficient to put it up on platforms like iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Prime. Uh, you go through what's called quality control, which is another headache I can talk about. Uh, <laughs> and then a couple months later, your film is up. You're the, you, own, you still own the rights in some cases, depends on the aggregator. Bitmax is the one we used where you pay an upfront fee and um, they get the film up 
and you don't give them any rights. It's just pretty much a through path that you're licensing to these platforms. Uh, there's other ones like Indie Rights and Quiver where they take a certain percentage of every sale. Um, but you're in control in that case. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to wait on a sales agent or a distributor and negotiating a contract. And, and that this sort of model works best for those who already have existing networks for their film. If your film audience has an existing, let's say you're making a film about a, a band and that band has a big following, um, then you have a network to promote your film to all existing. And that's kind of what we had with Fire. So we didn't need the added perks that come with a distributor. And we also didn't have to give up our rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And how did you use uh, Fire as an institution to, to fill in those gaps? Um, you said you have a network. How did, what, how, what does that look like in practice? So, you know, there, there's not only the, the having the financial support that comes from an institution, which is important, uh, that allowed me to hire a public, public relations firm to help pitch the film to reviewers. Uh, but FIRE has big email lists. We know students and faculty across the country uh, and others who are just interested in our issues. Um, tens of thousands of email address. We blasted them all with the film. Uh, I had a web developed. So I, I am the head of the communications team. We have 14 people on my team including a web developer and graphic designer who were able to create the website, who were able to create the graphic, uh, the key art, because whenever you put a film out, this is one of the things that most distributors will help you out with, some of them, uh, is create like the poster and all the other different dimensioned images you need to put them on the platforms. We had that in-house. Um, and one of our audiences for this had always been students. You know, We wanted to get this in front of students and we have a student network. Uh, our hope was that we would use that student network to show the film on campus, but COVID makes that a little bit difficult. <laughs> we have huge social media following, 44,000 followers on Twitter, 40,000 followers on Facebook, you know, thousands on Instagram as well. And you just keep pounding the message. We have a publication that we put out where we plug the film that should be landing in mailboxes here shortly. And you, you, we just have connections from our everyday work, uh, people that can help us out reporters that we work with on a daily basis who might be interested in covering the film. So that's how we utilized our existing network to distribute the film without a distributor. And uh, speaking, let's let's zero in a bit on BitMax. How, what was the, tell us about the decision making process that went into going with BitMax. Um, are, it seems like you're happy with them and and how, what are the various ways uh, that people can see the movie now, thanks to BitMax? Yeah, so it's bitmax.net. And like everything with making this film, I learned as I went and did research online. I knew nothing about self-distributing when I started the project. Uh, but I joined some filmmaker forums on Facebook. Uh, there's one called, uh, so there was a previous aggregator, I think called Distriber, that went belly <laughs> yeah. up and screwed over a lot of filmmakers. And after that, there was there started to become a community surrounding the fallout of it on Facebook. There's a group called like Stop Predatory Distribution and Aggregator Practices, uh, where they give you a lot of feedback on like how to self distribute your film or how to work with distributors. And all the filmmakers, uh, it's a private group. You have to request access. Give you feedback on you know their experiences with various distributors and aggregators. And I, so I had joined that group, and people had nothing but good things to say about BitMax and I did some research online. And the, one of the benefits of them is that they don't just do um, get your film up on platforms. They also help you with a lot of the other post-production stuff. Like if you need to create captions, which you'll need to do if you wanna be on any of the platforms or need subtitles, uh, they can create those for you. Uh, they helped create my digital cinema project, which is a drive. Uh, it's over in my closet, I could show it to you all that you need if you wanna um, show your film at theater. So they do much more than aggregation and as a result, it's a much more stable business model, in my opinion, um, especially with the fallout of Distriber. I kind of wanted someone who had been in business for a long time. They've been in business for like 25 years and who does more than aggregation. And then the key thing for me was that you pay an upfront cost and you keep your rights. Uh, I didn't want to give my rights to anyone else, which you'd have to do if you were going with a distribution company. Uh, you keep your rights. If I want the film to come down from Amazon or iTunes, I just tell them to take it down. That's how it works. Uh, and they pay out, I think, quarterly. So the film right now is up on Amazon Prime. It's on iTunes. It's on Google Play. It's on YouTube Movies. So if you'd search for the film on YouTube, you'll find it there. And I think it's like two ninety nine to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the film also did a virtual th uh, cinema release, which I can talk about later. It's kind of a new thing in the age of COVID. But 
and, and it's still playing with Angelica Film Center through virtual cinema. I don't know why they keep it, but I guess no cost to them. So that, that was kind of our, our thinking with BitMEX. Uh, very pleased with them, but beware, you got to get through quality control, which can be a headache. Uh, <laughs> that can be a headache. I'm glad you brought up distribu uh, Distriber because um, Tug is another company that had a similar fate. Uh, they they shut down apparently the very similar way that distributor shut down where they just kind of quietly crept away and didn't tell anyone and shut down their social media sites and Tug did that recently and there are a lot of victims of that too so I'll check out this including Facebook, us including us yeah <laughs> so I might hit you up uh, offline about that Facebook group and join yeah you. I can send you a link I don't remember the exact name of it but something yeah. like predatory distributors or something. Uh, you met, can you talk about the, the virtual cin uh, cinema experience? What's that? And yeah, so this is a new thing that many filmmakers are doing in the era of COVID theaters and many jurisdictions are shut down mm -hmm. uh, and they need to survive, uh, right? So uh, they're hosting what are called virtual cinema, which is essentially video on demand, but through us, through a theater uh, or a theater chain. So. You do the same thing you would do with your video on demand, you or uh, SVOD, you go to wherever they're hosting their films, put in your information, put in your credit card, and you can watch the film for like 48 or 72 hours. And a lot of times these films, you know, in order to encourage people to watch it this way, they'll also have a QA and a with a filmmaker or a film subject that plays right afterwards. And uh, this was nice for us <clears throat> because one of the things that you, happens when you go through an aggregator, especially if you're on a quick turnaround, is you don't know exactly when your film is going to be up on the platforms. You can target dates, but some of the platforms can take a while to ingest. Um, and we were working with our PR firm, and if you want to get a film reviewed, you kind of need to know when your film's coming out. That's a benefit of going the film festival route or theatrical route. You know when your film's coming out, and you can tell reviewers and your audiences when it's going to become available. We didn't know that. So our PR firm helped us secure a virtual cinema release with Angelica Film Center, which is you know, the, one of the top art houses in New York City. And the film started there on October 9th. And it ran through, uh, or it's continuing to run there as well, although the views have gone down because you can get it for cheaper now on Amazon Prime uh, or for free on Amazon Prime if you have Prime. Uh, but it was, it was really nice. And you, you keep like something like 50% of the profits uh, yourself. The other 50 goes to the, the theater. And it's a nice way to support theaters during these, during these tough times. We also kind of did it as a way, hopefully to get a New York Times review because what the New York Times used to do is if any film that plays within the five boroughs of New York City in a theater, uh, it gets reviewed by the New York Times. Unfortunately, the New York Times stopped doing that um, amidst COVID. Uh, mm. But we thought we might have a better shot if we were at Angelica. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't review it. And that's that was actually one of the big distribution challenges amidst COVID is that all these publications that typically review films are not reviewing films right now. They're laying off their freelance, they're laying off their staff. They're not hiring freelancers. The LA Times, I think, reviewed something like 14 films a week. Uh, they've laid off all their freelancers. They're not hiring freelancers to review films anymore. And I think they got two people on staff who review films. It used to be easier to get an LA Times review mm -hmm. than a New York Times review. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a big challenge for us is it, it was actually quite sad because you'd see the responses from these various publications and they were all like you know unfortunately we had to cut staff due to covid you know films aren't in theaters anymore um it was just one after another after another uh so it was kind of tough for us getting reviews uh but we got a couple we got hollywood reporter and roger ebert and some of the bigger ones but yeah that's great well in light of that how did you approach publicity um i mean you are in a unique time for a, a filmmaker to be releasing a movie during a pandemic how, how did you guys go about spreading the word and and uh letting people know that it's out there yeah well the main way of course was through our existing networks as i mentioned before i imagine that's where most of our views are coming from right now mm -hmm. it's just fires networks uh it was difficult not just because these publications are laying off staff and not reviewing as many films, but also we have an election yeah. uh, that happened last week. And the other challenge was we were competing with films at some of these big festivals. I mean, we started submitting the film for reviews to the trades in August, and that's around the time that TIFF was happening and it's a couple of other big film festivals. And, you know, reviewers are going to give their priority to those films. So that was a challenge for us as well. And it's another reason that you might want to go the festival route if you're considering it is it's, it's easier to get reviews, especially if you can get in a bigger one. Um, 
but we also knew it, you know it, there's always an excuse to not release your movie at a certain time you know um so we just decided we were going to put it out and see let the chips fall where they they may and and you know we've had a fair amount of success thus far we hope we'll get some additional coverage in the coming weeks we've got some irons in the fire there um and yeah that was kind of the approach is work our existing channels ask for imdb or amazon reviews uh it, it's hard to overstate how helpful those are to independent filmmakers in in driving further uh views to your film so uh, if you watch the film and haven't already uh, and can throw an imdb review our way if you enjoyed it please do Definitely. Well, and we're going to obviously help you promote it too in any way we can. Um, I, I have more of a, 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 a director question for you. What we, We've made a film about a woman who currently exists. She was portrayed by an actress, but it was still her life story, Suzette Kilo. I personally was very intimidated by that as a director uh, because I wanted her to be happy with it and I wanted her to like it and, and promote it and support it. And thank God she did. What was it like for you working with Ira and what did he think of the movie? So Ira loved the movie, or at least he tells me he loved the movie. Uh, <laughs> and, I get the sense, and I get the sense he actually does because he emails me <laughs> now and then with like promotion ideas. Oh yeah. Uh, which, which makes me think he wants more people to watch the movie and then enjoy <laughs> it. But uh, Ira never saw the movie until it was completed. He saw, <laughs> well, actually, I should, before we purchased the archival footage, he saw the rough cut because I wanted him to see it to make sure we didn't get anything factually wrong. Uh, right. So he had seen that, but the film was, the story was there at that point. Uh, there was nothing factually wrong. He had a couple of suggestions uh, for things to change, most of which we didn't actually take. Well, I don't know if anyone's seen the film, but there's a, a certain reveal about the neo-Nazi Frank Collin at the end uh, that's quite talk about the surprises. Ira wanted us to cut that stuff. We're, it, it's like one of the most cinematic, yeah, it's one of the most cinematic oh. aspects of the film. Uh, one of the biggest surprises. So we weren't gonna cut that. But Ira, very, from the get go, I mean, he's a civil libertarian, he's a free speech guy. He defended the free press throughout his career. He's not gonna tell us what we can and can't do on our film. And he said this in interviews, he said, you know, one of the things that you do when you agree to a project like this is you agree for the story to be told about you in whichever way the directors see fit. And uh, you're taking a risk there. And it's a risk I was willing to take because I trusted Nico and his team. And so um, we're just glad he liked it in the end. Wow. That's great. Wow. I'm not Jeez. surprised. He, he comes mm -hmm. off wonderfully in the film. Yeah. So. Smart guy, doesn't know anything about marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, I, with, with our network here, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we're focused on liberty minded filmmakers. And a lot of times that, that adds an extra layer of, uh, challenge to an already challenging um, independent film landscape. You choosing the topic of free speech, I mean, that's that's one of the hottest topics there is right now. Um, what was, uh, how did that aspect of it play into the way the film has been distributed and received? Well, I'd say the most stark example of that is probably is one that uh, Ted Courtney, you and I had discussed when we were talking about naming the film. Uh, I didn't want to call it Mighty Ira. That wasn't my first choice. Uh, the The reason that comes out, uh, the reason for the na that naming comes at the end of the film. If you watch it, you'll understand why we call it Mighty Ira. Uh, just a kind of a side note about that. Um, if I could do it all over again, I would have changed the logo because people in Britain in particular. Uh, oh, no! <laughs> uh, I think it's the Irish Republican Army. Uh, and we, I had actually thought of that before. But, uh, and he looks like he could be Irish. He does. <laughs> yeah. or, or it's like individual. This is a film about people's like individual retirement accounts in their Vanguard. Film, okay? So it's like, you know. Um, so I probably would have made the R and the A lowercase if I could do it all over again. But uh, I originally wanted to call it the civil libertarian because the film's really about what it means to be a civil libertarian. I'm not talking about political libertarian, I'm talking about someone who defends civil liberties uh, as one of their core life's work. Uh, but there was a concern that most people would interpret that as, you know, a libertarian, you know, a big L political libertarian and that might hurt us if we decided to go the festival route or in distribution because people would see it as a political film and it's not a political film. So that's one of the things that we did differently about the film 
um, as a result of kind of considerations surrounding social issues or political issues. Um, other than that, you know, I just kind of told the story the way we wanted to tell the story. Um, and, you know, the, the other concern was that because we're not, we're not attached to a distributor, um, it might be harder to distribute the film. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have a, you know, as Ted and Courtney, they work with, you know, Dada Films or Samuel Goldwyn, these bigger names, uh, that might turn some folks off. Um, I didn't see too much of that, although you don't know the reason you don't get reviewed in certain places, and maybe that could have been part of the reason. Um, but I think the benefits of distributing it through fire outweighed the, the costs of going through the process, dealing with all the stuff that comes along with, with putting your passion project in someone else's hands. Oh, yeah. It's, it's handing over your baby. Yeah. It's, it's don't know too well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I mentioned a, a little earlier when I was talking about Free Minds and uh, a lot of films that uh, we work with have sort of a, a social issue that can give birth to an impact campaign. What, what do you think the most important components would be for Mighty Ira and uh, some sort of impact campaign alongside of it? Yeah, well, the big impact campaign we, we hoped that we would be able to launch, but it's probably going to wait till next semester or next fall was the on-campus deal. Uh, this this film, although uh, it's deal that most of our film subjects are older, um, we pitched the AARP to include the film in their magazine. Uh, <laughs> it has the AARP magazine has some of the widest distribution in the country. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we tried to pitch them too. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, the film's really geared toward young people, kind of as a history lesson, reminding why a previous generation did what they did. I mean, the, some of the copy that I'm using in marketing right now is, um, you know one man, uh, a fading generation, the timeless value of free speech. And we wanted to educate a younger generation about the timeless value of free speech uh, in, in hopes that we can marshal that generation to the defense of free speech when it's under threat, whether it's under threat on social media or because of attempts to roll back section 230 or uh, the advocacy of hate speech codes. Um, you know, we, we would hope that this film would serve as just one uh, one avenue to change the culture. Uh, and so we hope to get the film on campus. And one of the other reasons it's beneficial to distribute it through FIRE is that you don't have to pay for any of the educational rights that come through uh, having the filmmaker, uh, the distributor distribute the film. You don't, we didn't sell our educational rights, so we can give it away for free to student groups that want to show it on their campus. And I've got more posters than I'd like uh, in the <laughs> office that we would distribute alongside. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I, I'm available to come speak on campuses. So that's the kind of the way, main way we want to have an impact on the conversation in particular on campus. And can you go a little more into detail? Like, what do you, um, what do you foresee for the next, you know, year with Mighty Ira and, uh, how, you know, how many campuses are you trying to hit? Are, are there, are there any other kind of innovative things that you're, that you have in the works. Yeah, so we've got something like 12,000 student members in our FIRE student network. And when a majority of them are back on campuses and they can actually bring a group into an auditorium, uh, we will create a campaign around the film. We will give them free DVD. We can, so another <clears throat> venue for distribution that we have is DVD and Blu-ray production. Uh, which I didn't talk about before, and is managed by a company called Allied Vaughn, which does uh, uh, manufacturing on demand. They're very easy to work with, and they get your film up on Amazon and, and all the other venues to buy DVDs and Blu-rays, um, something like $19.99 for DVD and $22 for Blu-ray. Anyway, I can purchase them at cost, so it's like two bucks. And so we will we'll give incentives to our student members to show the film, we'll send them a couple posters, we'll send them a copy of the DVD or Blu-ray, and we'll give them marketing support, advertising support, graphic design support if they need it to help market the film. And then we'd hopefully use that as a launching pad to create greater reforms, greater protections for free speech on campus. If the campus has speech codes, you know, we, we label them red for being uh, the, the worst, yellow for being okay, green for being uh, no speech restrictions. If they have red light speech codes, we hope that the film and the conversations around it would animate the students to kind of take action on their own campuses. 
Great. Uh, we're going to be moving to Q and A uh, in just a little while. So if you have any questions for Nico, please uh, send them directly to Courtney, and we will ask your question. Um, when uh, when we look back uh, at at the various um, kind of distribution um, outlets, sometimes we say, "Oh, that one is really." Turns out to be it was kind of lame, didn't really help much, but it, you know this one was a surprise. Like for Little Pink House, um, I'd say um, like airlines was it like turned out to be great, and we didn't necessarily know that going in. Were there kind of uh, if you were going to play the overrated underrated game with with the different ways that people can see your film, be it uh, it could be you know Amazon or even just physical, you know the making of DVDs any of the various ways people can see your film, what, what outlets would you say are overrated and underrated? Um, I'd say, so it depends what you're looking for. A lot of filmmakers need to make money, right? Uh, and in that respect, Amazon Prime is the worst of them. It gives you six cents for every hour of view. Um, fortunately, I don't need to make any money on this film. It's part of our public advocacy mission. Uh, but it is nice to be able to say that your film is on Amazon Prime because almost everyone has a Prime account. They all have means to watch it. There's apps on smart TVs so they can watch it on their TV, not on their computer, um, et cetera. So for us, uh, I'd say Amazon Prime is the go-to. Uh, it's how most people are watching our film. Internationally, I would say most of our, a lot of people are watching it on iTunes. And I haven't gotten reporting data from YouTube or, or Google Play, but I suspect both of those are uh, lower on the list. The DVD and Blu-ray uh, is for a, an older audience or for audiences that want to meet in person to watch the film. Although if they're meeting in person to watch the film, I just rented out an AMC theater because AMC is renting out private theaters now. Uh, I rented one out this weekend and to checked out the DCP. Uh, and if you can watch a film on using your DCP, it's the um, best quality that you can get. I highly recommend it. Uh, but it's like something like 800, 180 gigs uh, in order to play that footage. So um, Google Play overrated, iTunes properly <laughs> rated for uh, international markets, uh, Amazon Prime for us, uh, it's worth every penny and you don't get many pennies for using it. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So if, uh, if, if you could uh, give your three years younger self uh, advice mm -hmm. about uh, making um, your first feature film, what, what would you say to Nico from roughly three years ago? Well, if I knew I was making this film I, and I knew everything that would go into it, I probably wouldn't have made it. So I'm really glad I didn't because I loved having made this film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, um, the process was grueling. Uh, the first thing I would say is <clears throat> make sure you're shooting all your footage in the same frame rate. Uh, we had some problems <laughs> in quality control with that. Uh, shooting 26 um, and uh, 29, uh, long story. Uh, I would probably have also, so we used, uh, my co-directors are also the editors and cinematographer. Well, there's three people made this film essentially. Um, and then we had help from the outside by Ted and Courtney. And then we essentially just hired lawyers. We hired one archival producer and then Ryan and Scott, who I think are on this, were our fantastic composers and they probably have stories to tell about. Uh, composing and recording a film uh, amidst COVID because that landed right when they were getting ready to uh, mm. to uh, put the film to score. Um, yeah, you know, I don't, so much of the value that came from making this film was learning as I went. Uh, and, you know, I would have just given myself more information going into making the film, but then I probably wouldn't have learned about as much. Um, in all honesty, there are some things I would change about the narrative of the film, but I'm sure every filmmaker has that experience. Um, I probably would have hired a, um, a professional sound guy because as Scott and Ryan know, I asked that we had to ask them to uh, score some port parts of the film we didn't want to score or they didn't want to score because we had to cover some rough audio. So I apologize to the two of them for that. Um, amateurs over here. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yes, and speaking of Scott and Ryan, and then we'll get, uh, we see your uh, questions coming in, we'll get to those. Um, uh, let's give them some love. Uh, Scott and Ryan are very talented composers, 
uh, we, uh, we made use of their talents in our last two films. Um, what would you, what did you learn in that regard, Nico, in terms of what advice would you give to other filmmakers about the importance of music and, and uh, what did you go into it thinking and what did you come out of it thinking? Well, the score is incredibly important to Mighty Ira. Um, we went into the process with them kind of explaining what we thought we wanted. Uh, and they explained what they thought would serve the film best. And as they um, reminded us, um, directors kind of fall in love with their temp score. And we had kind of fallen in love with our temp score and kind of wanted them to emulate it. Uh, now, the ultimate score for the film is nothing like the temp score. And I think the film benefits from that. So the best advice I could give is to kind of trust the professionals uh, in this case, in this case, Scott and Ryan, they knew what they were talking about. They had made uh, films before. They had scored films before. We had not. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, it was it was a super smooth process working with the two of them. If there are any other aspiring filmmakers out there who are looking for composers, I I couldn't recommend it, them highly enough. They, they um, we were going to record musicians in person together in session. But because of COVID, I, I think Scott and Ryan, you guys had to record each artist individually and bring it together, bring them together in the edit. And I, I dare you to try and find in the film uh, evidence of that. It sounds I like they're in the room no together. Wow, wow. I had no idea that they had to do it like that. I mean, it makes take, sense. Take a bow, gentlemen, take a bow. Gee, well, they, they first told it to me and I was like, wow, that sounds like a headache. Uh, that sounds like a big pain. Um, but they just kind of said that's what we're doing and then before i knew it we had the score and it's, it's like as a filmmaker it's just one less thing off my back one less thing to stress about they just figured it out but i'm sure on the back end it was a big pain no they're no those guys are great that's awesome <laughs> so here's a question from nick uh, nick gilbert uh so yeah nick, nick gilbert would like to know he's curious about the media that you used in the development stage like pitch decks sizzle reels, treatments. Did you need any of that when it came to raising money to make it? We did put together a sizzle reel. So at the beginning of the film, um, most of the film is scored, right? Uh, but at the beginning of the film, we use a song from Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros called Man on Fire. And we fell in love with that film. It was the underscore for our sizzle reel, which was essentially Ira walking around New York City uh, with a couple of archival clips uh, baked in. It was two minutes long. And I needed to use that to pitch um my bosses and then some of the outside funders that we had uh and i love the sizzle reel it's great and it also helped us fall in love with that first song that we ended up using in the film uh and then getting the rights to that song is a whole nother um story uh scott and ryan you know also played music supervisor and in, in that sense and and managed to secure those rights through bmg thankfully all the rights were based with one rights holder sometimes my understanding Scott and Ryan could correct me is uh, sometimes the rights are dispersed uh, and that just sounds like a headache. Uh, but we were able to negotiate the rights for that first song and um, that was in our sizzle reel. And that's all we had was essentially a sizzle reel. Um, the trailer was created at the end. Um, yeah, we didn't even know how we were gonna get into the film. Uh, the, the intro to the film is the last part that we filmed. Uh, we were racking our brains trying to figure it out. But yeah, that the sizzle reel was it. So it sounds like the sizzle was very helpful to you in terms of just getting things going, getting it set up financially. Yes. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I, I do feel like no matter what you're pitching these days, whether it's a doc, a TV series, it, it, it really, it, it matters to just show that, show the people, the creative vision. Uh, so I, I, I'm finding too, and, and just the stuff we're working on that sizzles and decks are kind of yeah, we, we end up make, we, we make really. a lot of sizzles and decks. Yeah, we make them for other people's projects because they're, they're just so in demand because you can't really compete with a sizzle and a deck with just a pitch, you know, kind of need something more. Yeah, I'm not sure if the project would have ever gotten off the ground if we didn't have a sizzle to show uh, the decision makers. So it's, it's super important. And uh, especially in that part, since you're not distributing the sizzle, uh, find some good music. Uh, you do whatever you want. Put yeah. Under, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That'll really help uh, up the production totally. value of your sizzle. Yeah. Yeah. To, you can tell your lawyers to go away for a little while. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. um, that's always a nice thing to do. Here's a question from Scott. If you have any. Scott, and Scott is one of the co, uh, Scott McRae, one of the co-composers. So, and if uh, we'll have a bit more time, we could probably squeeze in 
another couple questions. Uh, so send those questions directly to Courtney. Um, from Scott, uh, Nico, I think all of us who create media with themes of liberty face the challenge of walking the line between something that might be perceived as propaganda versus purely a work of art. Is that something you grappled with during the process of making the film? And if so, how did it impact your choices? Yeah, you know, um, I can't say it's something that I grappled with. Uh, I, it's probably something I should have grappled with. But I knew the story overall was going to be compelling because I recorded the podcast with Ira and all the stories we tell in the film came out in that podcast. Um, and he's such a likable guy. Uh, like Roger Ebert review said that even though it was a mixed review slash negative review, said he treasured the moments he got to spend with Ira. If I were not associated with an organization, I was just like an independent filmmaker. There's probably more that I would have done with the film. I, you know, Ira's very critical of the modern ACLU, for example. That's probably a discussion that you would want in the film. But I also work for an organization that, you know, we're not here to pick fights with the modern ACLU. Uh, we work with them quite a bit. Uh, and it wasn't core to the story that we were trying to tell, which was, you know, the story of free speech, racial justice, and talking across lines of difference. So, you know, in that sense, maybe the film's a little bit of propaganda, but that's always the mission. The mission of the film was to change hearts and minds. Uh, Michael Moore's films are propaganda, if you want to label them that, you know, so, you know, a lot of documentary films are. Um, but I, I hope the messages that we tell are still compelling to people. You know, it's, I, I think they can stand on their own, regardless of what you want to call them, and they're compelling on their own. Yeah, I think uh, um, I have a bit of a bone to pick with, with, the, with the people who uh, kind of selectively say what is propaganda and what is not. I mean, any kind of, if, if you're writing anything. Oh, it's only propaganda if they don't agree right. with you. Exactly. The, exactly. the viewers will only like, say it's propaganda if they don't agree with you. Exactly. Any film or any piece of art that deals with <laughs> any kind of issue, social, philosophical, religious, the creator is trying to convey, you know, not always, but, but very often, a particular point of view. And I think that this, this term of propaganda is, is very selectively used uh, and it's not used, shall we say, in a viewpoint neutral way. No, it's not. I mean, I don't, I don't remember anyone out there calling an inconvenient truth propaganda when it came out. You know, that's a documentary. Um, it, it's, it's selective. So, you know, I, I, take, I take those sort, it's an excuse to pan a movie that you don't agree with um, if you're a reviewer. Right, right. Oh, and it, it, so some things that will bug the shit out. I don't know if I can say. Oh, geez, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm self censoring oh. myself about my free speech movie. Some of the things that will bug you. We almost had it. Some of the things that will bug you if you ever make a movie from reviewers is, uh, you know, they might call it propaganda, or they they might pan the movie because you didn't make the movie they wanted you to create. Oh, uh, totally, yeah. Which oh, is, that, that, that was that review. Um, uh, they're, they're referencing the other. There was another ACLU movie made. And that yeah. was just, it sounds like, I haven't seen it, but it seems like people who are just uh, totally, and the reviewer, I mean, you, you know it better than I do, obviously, Nico, but yeah. he was so oblivious to actually how the ACLU has changed over the years and not in the direction of, of more civil liberties and, and free speech. And it, it just sort of betrayed this ignorance of what's really going on. And yet he was trying to speak from this posture of authority, like, oh, compared to this other one that was at TIFF, like, of course it was at TIFF. It reflects what the monoculture wants. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was a Roger Ebert uh, review. And uh, when that review got assigned to the re reviewer who ultimately reviewed our film, it was the same reviewer who reviewed The Fight, which is an ACLU documentary that came out earlier in the year. It doesn't cover any of the same stuff that our film covers. Uh, it covers kind of the ACLU's lawsuits against the Trump administration. Uh, and it does so in a very laudatory way. The only criticism that the filmmakers ever give of the ACLU was for its positions in Charlottesville and Skokie, uh, which is the complete opposite of what we did with our <laughs> film, of course. Uh, but I read, the, I read this reviewer's review of the fight and I knew he would give a mixed review of our film because everything he loved about the fight betrayed his um, political and ideological biases uh, and suggested to me that uh, he wouldn't love the free speech arguments that this film and Ira make. Yeah, I think we should have a separate um, 
Free Minds film session just on uh, reviewers <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes. I think Sam's given the thumbs up. He does. Yeah. He does uh, reviews. Um, <laughs> Uh, so he knows about that. I think there, there's so much that uh, those of us who share these peculiar views um, need to know about how to uh, deal with and approach yeah, reviews. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Uh, from the business side, would you approach a narrative film differently from a documentary? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine the whole process would be different. I've never made a narrative before. Uh, the so what well, the process for making this film or at least telling the story of this film really came from Ted and Courtney who suggested I uh, at least I think you guys suggested I print up the transcripts from all of our interviews and archival footage which you know is a big line item itself it's not cheap to do that and then read through all those transcripts um, which I did it's probably like four or five binders uh, and go through it with a red, a green, and a blue highlighter. Everything in red is stuff that has to go in the film. Everything in green is stuff that if you can make it work, great. And everything in blue is stuff that, you know, keep it around. And then what I did is I organized all those highlights. Uh, because I had them in transcript form, I also had them in digital form. I organized all those highlights uh, in a Google Doc by category. Um, I knew kind of roughly the story I wanted to tell. And I wrote the story that way. So the, the creative process, the storytelling process for a narrative, I imagine, is quite different. It's more in your head. Um, here, I just is like putting together a puzzle um, based on the interviews and the archival. And that actually was quite fun. Once you get over the fact that you're probably reading 300 pages of transcripts or 3,000 pages of transcripts, excuse me. Uh, but you know, like so much else, and Tim and Courtney told me this as well, take it one day at a time, a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, and before long, you'll have a completed film. Um, don't get in your head too much. Don't think too much about all the work that you have coming down the pike. Just take it one day at a time. It's like the same novelists say the same thing. Uh, you know, write one page a day. Uh, it's much easier to think about one page a day than, than the 400 pages you've yet to write. Yeah. Uh, this will be our last question. And here's from uh, Sam. Uh, what role does talent play in the success of a freedom focused film? So in this case, Ira would be the talent. Well, we had a lot of talent in the film, you know, um, the main, yeah, the main, yeah. a, a lot. I mean, talent is huge. So for distribution, for one, a lot of distributors won't be interested in your film unless you have a big name attached to it. At least that's what I've heard from all the filmmaker forums. I know. But it, unless you have a compelling story teller, you're not going to have a compelling story or it's going to be much harder to have a compelling story without Ira, who can who tells stories so vividly, as I learned in the podcast. I wouldn't have put him on camera. It was precisely because of his ability to tell a story that I put him on a camera. Um, it's just getting him to stop telling the story was the challenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, ben yeah. Stern, you know, um, a Holocaust survivor, 99 years old, survived nine concentration camps, two death marches, and two ghettos. An incredible storyteller, uh, an incredible story to tell. Uh, Brian Stevenson, who was the subject of Just Mercy, that film and uh, an HBO documentary called Equal Justice. Uh, big name talent, uh, big in the uh, racial justice world, uh, compelling storyteller. Yeah, I mean, you got to have compelling subjects, especially with the documentary. You're telling your doc, your story is you know about these subjects, and you'd hope that they be compelling. So, super important. Well, I, I want to squeeze one more, and before we ask you uh, simply how folks can learn more about the project, um, what would what would you hope, let's say, a typical college student would take away from Ira, from this movie? Um, you know, a lot of them have a particular point of view about what free speech is, that it's for the powerful people, that it's oppressing the weak. Um, what would, what message do you hope that uh, that this um, uh, student would come away with after watching Ira, Mighty Ira? Well, I think it was Socrates who said, you know, as you uh, learn more, you, you realize all you don't know. Um, that's kind of how I came to the project. I didn't know Ira's story, um, but I did know some of the history uh, sur surrounding the fight for free speech in the middle part of the century. And I knew that my generation uh, had largely forgotten that history and that I felt like that was an animating reason that they were calling for more censorship on not only college campuses, but in the broader society. Um, 
and so you know kind of getting away from the question it was it was to remind a generation uh of the timeless as i said earlier value of free speech and that's the thing that i'd hope they'd take away from it and i'd hope they'd also take away from it the fact that freedom of speech is an insurance policy you know you you defend these rights some people defend them because of the individual autonomy that it that it recognizes but other people defend them because you know we are all passionate about different things and sometimes that passion offends other people but unless you have the freedom to articulate your beliefs and share your passions with others who might also become passionate about them um, then you, you cease to live in a free society at least to cease to live in an interesting society as i would put it um, and uh, you know some of these speech restrictions that the younger generations advocate for um, would neuter that. And, and so Ira's story, I think, is a compelling reminder that not everything uh, the old folks out there believe uh, is wrong. Sometimes there's a reason for believing them and a reason for fighting for them. Well said. Well said. How can people learn more about Mighty Ira? So we have a website, mightyira.com. Uh, the website is deliberately sparse. It does only those things that I want you to do, which are sign up for our email list, uh, watch the movie, uh, watch the trailer, read the description. Uh, so you can figure out all the ways to watch it there. And we also have links to where you buy, it, buy the DVD and Blu-ray. Great, uh, I wanna make sure everyone saw that Sam Staley uh, sent the link, the Amazon link to everybody. Yeah. Um, so that's there too. So everybody should go out, watch Mighty Ira and make sure to buy it. Um, and review you know, it on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, buy, buy it a few yeah. times, right? Nico, that, that's a lot, right? <laughs> um, and um, we have social media accounts too, um, social, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram. They're all they're all linked on the website. And I want to remind everybody that uh, Free Minds Film will be back this Thursday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, to uh, discuss uh, another provocative documentary called What Killed Michael Brown. And we will be uh, very pleased to welcome uh, uh, acclaimed author and writer, Shelby Steele and his son, the director of the film, Eli Steele. Uh, so be sure to sign up for that, register for that the same way you did for this discussion with Nico. If you go back to the same email that, uh, that either Sam or I sent you, uh, you can do that there. Um, and then as Courtney and I mentioned earlier, stay tuned for more Free Minds uh, uh, programming coming uh, probably early December. We're going to have our virtual workshops, uh, meaning that if you have a project at any stage in development, uh, you can get one on one um, consultation from uh, our stable of industry experts. Uh, this is a uh, this is a very, very popular feature that we offer and we expect it to fill up pretty quickly. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So on behalf of uh, Courtney, Katherine, Amber, and Sam, everybody at Florida State uh, University, uh, DeVoe Moore Center, and, and for Free Minds Film, thank you to Nico, and thank you to all of you. Yeah, thanks, guys. And Sam, thank you for including the link to register for Thursday. It's, yeah, it's right in here in the chat, so that, that might make it easier for everyone, too. So Good hope thinking, to see you all Sam. again. <laughs> Thursday, Nico, this was fantastic. Thank you, thank Sam, you. your whole team.